Welcome back to Ball Talk. I'm Tom Ackerman. Great to have you with us. The St. Louis chapter of the Baseball Writers Association presents this. And as you'll experience throughout your subscription, Ball Talk is special, not only because of our amazing collection of writers, but it's the only podcast in all of professional sports presented by and co-hosted by competitive members of the print media in the same market. And we invite some very special guests as well. It's Ball Talk, ensuring the tradition of sports journalism excellence that it continues. You know, last week we had Derek Gould. I've got this list of credentials for the first person that I'm going to talk about. And Derek is in a big time seat. Um, he is in a seat as the Cardinals lead beat writer. We know what that means. Uh, there have been some major, major award winners over the years. J. Roy Stockton started this in 1914, Bob Brigg, and then this man from 1978 through 2001. We are talking about Hall of Famers, and we are joined by Hall of Fame writer Rick Hummel, the commish from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Let me read through some of these, if I may. Past president of the Baseball Writers Association of America. Received the highest honor in the baseball industry in 2006, the Career Excellence Award. And as I mentioned, he is commemorated in the writer's wing in Cooperstown. I've been there a couple of times and always make sure I stop by to see uh, the commish commemorated there. About to celebrate his writing for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Rick Hummel, did I miss anything in that introduction? Uh, that's very kind, Tom. Thank you. Uh, you didn't miss much, no. No. <laughs> You are the best. Uh, it's great to be along with you. And uh, he is a member of Halls of Fame. He's author of books. He's been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He has uh, really done it all. And joining us is a real up and comer here in St. Louis. I've had some fun getting to know him through the years. From KMOV, he is the newest card holder, the Baseball Writers Association of America. Does a great job writing for that television station's website and has for some time. Brendan Schaefer. Great to have you on Ball Talk. How are you? Glad to be here with you, Phyllis, Tom. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. Always sharp on social media and a great analyst of baseball. And with us, he's been covering baseball in the big leagues for more than 25 years. The Braves for, what, uh, 20 years, perhaps, with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and now the Athletic. He covered the Marlins for eight seasons. He covered that world championship team in 1997. It is great to have a former Georgia sports writer of the year, David O'Brien with us on ball talk. How are you? Good. How you guys doing? Doing great. Tom, we always, Tom, we Tom, always it must be sure. noted. This guy's, this guy's from Kansas. Now. He's like, job, baby. Guys, so. Well, okay. Well, here, <laughs> and then it's appropriate that I brought this along to, to drink my water here. Oh, God, that's yeah. disgusting. You go. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thank you for your service. You are very welcome. And that's coming from an Indiana alum, by the way, but as a lifelong Tiger, as people who know me well. Mm. I was just so, in okay. God's country a couple of days ago. I was at the Mecca at Allen Fieldhouse, by the way. Oh, well, you know what? Now that uh, the world has opened back up, I will admit that is one of the special places in sports. December 11th, we're coming for you. Yeah, that's right. Bring it. That's right. It's on. Uh, what would Joe Strauss say about that? He would say uh, that he, he would be down on Mizzou on that one. I'm pretty sure. He'd be um, down on both. Yeah, he'd, yeah, he'd be down he on would, both. He would talk about he would, cheating, <laughs> cheating at both places. He would find holes in both programs, yes, no doubt. Um, David, what are your recollections of Mr. Strauss, one of our favorite people? Great guy. I loved it. He was one of the few people more cynical than me. Um, he was... Uh, he was a treat. I loved him. Joe was great, great writer. Uh, yeah, he, we did not overlap here. I know that was a question of the thing. He was before me here, um, yep. but I got to know him well. I worked beside him at games for you know, most of a couple of decades. So he was, uh, I always look forward to seeing him, especially when he had chances to talk, like at the winter meetings and that kind of thing. So, but uh, spring training. Absolutely. For those who had, uh, the treat to be able to sit next to him in a press box or, you know, text with him or whatnot. It was, it was definitely that. I'll tell you what he would tell me. He'd be like, all right, let's go. Let's, let's get with the topics. Enough about me. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, right into it. Though. Yeah. Your joke kind of overlapped, David, I'll start with you on this actually. Um, and it kind of overlapped from the old school into the new school. I thought that he 
adapted very well uh, with the game uh, through the years, at least from a coverage standpoint. We'll touch on that a little later in the show about social media, and, and maybe we'll get into that a little bit uh, because Brendan's been so good at it. But, you know, he did well at that. Um, but he also saw the game sort of evolve through the years. Just I guess it's a general question. Where, what is the state of the game today as opposed to when you or Kamish or, or Joe – uh, got started in this business? Uh, well, there's a whole lot less of uh, get them over, get them in. <laughs> As I was talking to Kevin Seitzer, who's the Braves hitting coach who has been around, you know, was a great hitter with the Royals back in the day, broke in when George Brett was, he was supposed to be George Brett's replacement. But uh, Seitz said that the problem, the reason there's three outcomes today, more th- more so than there's ever been, is that as he sees it, guys are not penalized for striking out. And they're only rewarded for slugging. So it's only natural for guys to do, you know, to, to uh, adjust their launch angles and all that and try to hit the ball out of the park. Cause that's what they're being rewarded for with shifts, with contracts, with all that. It's, it, it basically tells them there's every reason in the world to try to hit the ball in the air and out of the park and, and very few reasons to try to, you know, hit the ball through the infield or, 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 you know, just put it in play and that kind of thing. So. Guys aren't adjusting their uh, their approach with two strikes. Very few guys are. When they do, it stands out now, whereas it used to be the rule. Uh, and and I don't know how many times I see every game. It seems like I see you know a team, the Braves or another team, put two guys on base with none out and fail to get him to get a run in, which didn't used to happen much at all. So or at least it didn't seem like it did. So it's just evolved a lot. I mean, there's a lot of obviously things that have changed for the better. And the use of analytics has been uh, uh, for defense and that kind of thing has been has changed the game remarkably. And for pitchers, you know, to sh- uh, to to uh, shape pitches, you know, to be able to look at super slow mo with their pitches and all that. So it's it's made pitching has just evolved so far in ten years. But you know, there's a little good and there's a lot of uh, there's a little of of uh, negative. I think we, we need this. We're still working through it all. I think there's it, some things need to be uh, straightened out and get a little bit more, get a, get a better mix of old and new than it seems like right now, the game's being played. It just, a, it's, it's a little bit of a different game than what we're used to. Yeah. Kamish, uh, Wade Boggs celebrates a birthday this week. And you know, I was thinking about that growing up, watching him in the eighties. You know, that's when it was cool to hit singles. I mean, he was, he was as good as anyone to do at singles and doubles. Well, OB would have fallen out of his chair last night of Don Mattingly, uh, who we're both very familiar with. The game is tied at the top of the seventh inning. They have a runner on first base, and he pinch hits a relief pitcher for his pitcher to try to sacrifice him over. And the guy bunts through strike three. Molina picks off the other guy at first base. So, so much for that small ball stuff. <laughs> Yeah, are you uh, you've been able to watch the game over the years, Commission? I mean, is the game in a good place right now? Oh boy, uh, good might be a little strong. I think evolving is is as Dave referred to it a little bit. I, I there's got to be a better way to entertain the fans than just home runs. Uh, runs are good, I think. I mean, no matter how you get them, you don't have to get three at once necessarily. But um, uh, so many guys, he talked about two-strike approach. That's if they have an approach at all with two strikes. They just, they grow up there trying to launch. And um, I think Mike Schultz, the manager here, tries to play a, a small ball game sometimes because he doesn't have a lot of, of he has some home run hitters, <clears throat> not as many as some teams, not like Toronto, for instance, for God's sakes. <laughs> They're all home run hitters there. I, I don't imagine they've bunted all season long, have they? <laughs> but uh, the uh, I, you got to have a different way to go about. It. They tried to sh- shorten the games, and yet they're trying to increase scoring. Well, you can't do both. If you increase scoring, you're going to have longer games. Now, will they be more entertaining? Well, maybe so. But uh, the, the original premise of all this stuff was to shorten the game under three hours, and they got a long way to go before they can do that. Brendan, when did all of this start? Do you think? with uh, the change in the game and the reliance on analytics and and kind of what's your observation from your standpoint? Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of different things kind of going on at once and teams, you know, lately it's, it's the deal with the pitchers and going for the RPMs. And I think StatCast has definitely contributed a lot to that because 
you know, we're all now noticing the data that teams have been working on back to the Moneyball Oakland A's and uh, teams have been kind of catching up to that level. And so you've got that on the pitching side and on the hitting side, you've got launch angle and really whether it's entertaining or not, it's not necessarily that fewer runs are being scored right now. And so teams aren't really incentivized in, in a lot of ways to go for the small ball stuff. And like Kamish mentioned, with what happened last night in that game with a failed bunt and a pickoff at first, it's like if you're not practicing those fundamentals and executing them on a regular basis, it's kind of hard to draw them out in a given spot in a game when you really need it because you haven't done it. And, and so who's to expect that you're going to be able to thrive with it in that moment? And so it's kind of a catch-22 that baseball's in where – yeah, sure, younger generation might enjoy the home runs, but I think all generations of baseball fans can appreciate when the ball's in play and things are happening, good defensive plays, things like that. And so uh, it's, it's kind of an issue when you're not able to to find that blend and, and be able to entertain masses across the age spectrum and across the fandom. You know, uh, Commissioner, I heard Mike Shannon in his 50th year in the broadcast booth mention the other day he was grumbling and said on the air, you know, <laughs> wow. Yeah, they they just don't scout like they used to. You know, the, the scouting has been missed. He didn't like something that he saw adjusting to a certain batter. Um, what do you think about old school versus new school? I mean, is there still a place for the for the baseball lifers for for those who have been in this game for decades and decades? I hope so. That might be the last bastion of baseball lifers, is the old time scout. You know, because they. Sometimes the analytics cannot tell you what the eyes can tell you. And, and these guys have been watching ball and tendencies for, they'll fill out the reports like they're supposed to, but they, they're looking for other stuff. They're looking for how a guy reacts to things. And I don't think the analytics tell you that either. Um, so unfortunately teams have trimmed their scouting where the old school scouts are, are very few and far between, but I still think there's a place. And a guy like Tony La Russa being back and managing I think will help that philosophy a little bit because he believes in the mesh of old school and new school. And this guy's won more games than Connie Mack and Connie Mack owned the club. So he wasn't going to fire himself. Um, so I think might, that might help a little bit because Tony does rely on, on stuff that scouts see, you know, talk to scouts uh, and, but not to ignore analytics because as, as we've talked about before that for defense, they're fantastic. I don't know how much they've, they've helped the offense, but for defense, they're wonderful. Yeah, David, I, what do you think about LaRusso? I, I wanted to ask you about that. You know, we, we touched on this on Ball Talk a couple weeks ago about the incident with Mercedes, and I feel like there was a lot of pushback on LaRusso, especially in Chicago, a lot of like, let's get this old guy out of here. Meanwhile, he's winning a lot of games. Um, and, you know, if we're going to advance the game, shouldn't we know also about where the game has come from? And as Kamish pointed out, he's he's a nice balance of the two. What do you think? Of him? Uh, well, I think Tony could just could easily could make it easier on himself just by, you know, just limiting a couple of the th comments that he said. I think if he gave a crap about it, that he would. But he doesn't. Mm -hmm. So that's why he says the things he does that provocative or whatever. He could avoid those things. Um, <laughs> the Braves have a mid a, a manager in his mid 60s who's been in the organization for 45 years. And he doesn't run into those problems because. He's conscious of just little things he said. Again, Tony's a Hall of Famer. He doesn't have to worry about what people think. So, and he doesn't care if people dislike him or think that he's uh, past his prime or you know uh, is it Neanderthal thinking because he knows his team's in first place and he's going to say what he wants to say. But there is definitely a room for those guys in the game. I think there there needs to always be room for guys. Uh, Snicker, the Braves manager, surrounded himself with old school coaches yet they've all embraced analytics as far as taking the information, explaining it to the players, presenting it to them so that it's not, uh, it's not the nerd in the, in the analytics room coming to the players and giving them a printout sheet going, here's what we've got. And the player going, who are you? You know, it's, you've got the coaches, they've got Ron Washington, another guy in his mid sixties presenting this information about why we should shift and you should stand here for this. So it works. So that's a, they're a good balance of old and new. Um, but uh, Snit is Snicker is sn smart enough to understand that players are players have changed and it doesn't take a whole lot to deal with today's players 
not being so stubborn and saying certain things that you just can't get away with with today's players again unless you're winning now if the if the white Sox don't aren't winning he's not going to get away with saying those things it's going to be you lost the clubhouse he's going to get fired but they're not they're winning so power to him he can say whatever he wants to say as long as they keep winning uh, yeah when uh when snit and schulte went head to head a couple of years ago i thought that was a great matchup of a couple of old school thinkers and baseball guys but that said i mean schulte's a lot younger brendan um, and, you know, does have a good feel for the new game, I think. At the same time, what's your evaluation of it? Yeah, I think, I think it kind of comes in waves, right? We asked the question, is there room for these baseball lifers? But I think Snicker and even Schilt, a little bit younger, are good examples of guys who have been in organizations and have seen this game from every different perspective that you could hope to see it. And so you, you, you get those guys into manager positions alongside – you know, guys like Tony La Russa returning. And for a while, it was the, the recent former player with no experience that, that was getting a lot of manager jobs. And so I think it's a nice blend because it sort of tends to correct itself over time, where if you, you stray too far into one direction, the game starts to kind of recognize that and is able to say, well, these are maybe the kind of guys we want to target to bring it back towards some balance. And I think now across the game, you have, at least from a manager perspective, a lot of different perspectives like that where you have guys with different backgrounds and, and are able to kind of blend a little bit of the old, a little bit of the new. But I like what David said about just being able to relate to today's players. A lot of times that can be really beneficial just to make sure you don't say the wrong things and you have the guys in the clubhouse on the coaching staff that you know this is a guy who on this particular topic can get through to a guy to say, you know, make him understand that this is a good good way to do it, even if he's not so familiar with the analytics. The shift is definitely an area where I feel like pitchers have had to be convinced as well of, you know, base hit that goes to where the second baseman should have been standing. Yeah, that's going to frustrate a guy at first. But over time, I think if you've got the right pieces in place where coaches can help facilitate and understand and help guys get a handle on what the analytics are saying, that could be beneficial. And that's just all part of it, blending the old with the new. Uh, Schulte doesn't really hold back when it comes to saying what's on his mind, Kamish. He pretty much let it loose a couple weeks ago, his feelings on sticky substances and the MLB enforcement of them. Uh, you asked uh, Adam Wainwright this week about his reaction to the Sports Illustrated story, uh, naming him in the Bubba Harkins uh, exchange, and, and he said, I did use it. I mean, what have we learned from this commission? Why is all of this coming out now? What, why is this happening now? Well, one of the team batting averages now, like 230. Yes, that's one of the reasons why it's coming out. Uh, um, and Wayno and, and Shildy, and I'm sure many others will tell you that the, the substances they were that they were con being concocted by the Angels Clubhouse guy are not nearly what are being concocted now. A little more high tech uh, array of, of, of substances by chemists uh, standing by waiting for your call. Um, it's, that's a cat and mouse game. The hitters have been cheating for years. The pitchers have been cheating for years. Now what, what happens with the hitters? What do they do next? Um, but what does baseball do now, I guess, is the question we're trying to address here. And I don't know what you can do other than have a guy hand his glove to the umpire every time he comes into a game, you know, and the umpire can look at it and see if there's anything in there. But that seems to be where most of this stuff would be, unless it's on your sleeve or, or someplace on your, on your body. You, it wouldn't, wouldn't be on your, be on your shirt rather than your body per se, but um, this is just one more. Uh, oh, it's not a nail in the coffin, but it's baseball doesn't need to go through stuff like this. Uh, maybe, I and mean, then baseball is guilty of whatever they've done to the balls, too. They made a point they're going to do something to the balls, and they haven't exactly come clean on what that was, but that accounts for some of the lower averages and 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 higher strikeout totals. God knows I didn't think it, there'd be a higher strikeout total, but there is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, David, there's still a romanticism in this game. I mean, can't they just tell us what the rules are and the parameters and, and people will find the love in the game. I just don't understand what's with all this sneaking around. Well, cheating's always been part of the game. It's just taken to another level with science and, and like Kamish said, with uh, sticky substances evolving from pine tar, which players actually, hitters actually liked when pitchers used just pine tar because it gave them command. The ball is really slick. Uh, that's why they scuff it up with that, you know, the mud before the games, because if they didn't, 
no pitchers would have very good command. They're so slick. I don't know why. I've, the Japanese ball is actually a little more uh, is a little rougher, and I don't know why they can't use a ball or consider using a ball like they do in Japan. That's uh, that uh, doesn't require you know any sticky substances for a pitcher to have a better grip on it. But you know, once pitchers discovered what they could do with spin rate, because with the advent of these super slow mo cameras. Uh, and and labs like driveline of seattle pitchers could see what happens when you add 300 rpms to a to a slider it just t- changes the pitch entirely to a fastball it changes the pitch entirely so now spin spin rate is the whole thing whereas nobody talked about spin rate three four years ago that's that's what everybody talks about now even more than velocity uh it's not so important to throw 98 everybody throws nine everybody every team's got a couple of guys or, or five guys that throw 98 or more now it's spin rate. What can you do with the velocity? Because a guy throwing 95 with a, you know, 3,000 spin rate is an entirely different pitch than throwing 95 with a 2,300 spin rate. So the sticky substances are, are as long as they, they could get away with it, that's what they were doing. And, you know, they're putting it on the cap. Putting, and, you know, pitchers have used, like Kirk Kimball, when he was with the Braves, you could always see the, the, the on his hat from the rosin or pine tar, which was legal. I mean, or which was not, uh, even if it wasn't legal, like I said, hitters didn't mind pitchers using that. So opposing managers didn't have it checked, but now that guys are using, you know, the spider spider tack, what, and, and all these other things, these mixtures of suntan lotion. And the, you know, there's so many different things now they're having them checked because that changes. That's more than just giving a guy command. So it doesn't hit a batter. That's that's giving them spin rate. And, now it changed the whole thing. So, you know, like I said, I think they need to look at the, uh, at the actual ball and, and maybe they can do something about that. So it's not so slick. So there's no excuse for using all these different sticky substances. I believe it was 63% of pitchers last week. The spin rate went down, uh, yeah. which is a pretty significant number there, Brendan. What do you think about all this? Yeah, I think we'll have to wait, too, to see if there are increases in hit batters, if they really want to crack down on sunscreen and rosin and, and, and things like that. Pine tar, as David mentioned, that have been in the game for a while. But, yeah, it's it's the, the revolution of having that available data. And once you see the impact of the spin rates, it's like teams all kind of at the same time have rushed to say, all right, we need to figure out the best way. And, the, you know, hiring chemists, some of them to basically experiment to say, all right, if we put a little bit of this, a little bit of that, all right, that's what that does. And you can you can match that up with each other and, and find out what concoction works the best. And that's what I think getting out of the game would be beneficial. But if they're talking about, well, you know, if we can't differentiate between this or that, and we've got to crack down on everything. That's when I think you, you do have to find another way to be able to maintain player safety because batters don't want it. Pitchers don't want it. Guys not having any command of the baseball and, not necessarily knowing where it's going to go. That could be a safety issue down the road. So uh, we should know pretty soon what it looks like specifically and how baseball wants to enforce the new guidelines that they're coming up with. But I do think they have to be a little bit careful. If, if like David said, they're going to do this with the, the baseballs and, and not really be open to, to tell everybody what that exactly is and for whatever reason being resistant to going with some of the other foreign leagues that have found a baseball that seems to be working for those guys – you kind of have to pick one or the other. Are you going to attack it that way? Or are you going to say, yeah, we're going to allow some, some sort of substances and be okay with that without crossing the line of competitive balance. Yeah. And Wayno said yesterday, uh, you know, Hey, you watch me. I don't go to my gloves. I tried it six or seven times and that's it. I, it didn't work for me. You'd have to go to the glove every time for it to work. Uh, speaking of Wainwright, I, I shudder to think Brendan, where the Cardinals would be without him. I mean, they'd be in major trouble. He has bailed them out a couple times here recently. Yeah, you look over their last 10 or 12 games, the only starts that they've won have been Adam Wainwright starts as of this recording of the podcast. And it's really nice to have that veteran presence when you've got the injuries that they've gone through and you've got some of the younger guys in the organization, maybe not quite ready for the Cardinals yet, like a Matthew Libertor that they've hesitated, haven't, tried to pull the trigger on bringing him up yet and so if you know it's hard as one man in a five-man rotation to get a team through a stretch like this 
when the rest of your starters aren't really performing up to expectations. But uh, as far as putting the team on his back, he's basically done everything in his power to be able to do that. Cardinals winning his last couple of starts and trying as best as they can to keep him above water. David, was he ever close to going to the Braves, you think? You think he was going back to Atlanta? Uh, they definitely talked to him and were definitely interested. But in hindsight, considering how limited the Braves' resources were, um, he might I, – I don't know if he wanted, you know, a one-plus one an option. But, you know, they spent $11 million early on on, on Drew, Drew Smiley, which was – turns out probably wasn't a great investment. But – they only had enough to, to get a couple of guys and they went Drew Smiley and Charlie Morton, $26 million for those two. So I think they definitely were interested in, in, in Wayno, but I think all things being equal, Wayno was going to go back to the Cardinals. I think the Braves were probably the only team he would have, he would have uh, preferred to go to, you know, with so much family still in, in uh, Georgia, St. Simon's Island around that area. I think that was the appeal, obviously, uh, and, and and he you know he's known Snitker since his minor league days. So, but I, I don't know how much there was to it. You know how how close it actually was. If he was just you know wanted that out there that uh, you know for the Cardinals to have some sense of urgency or know that there were options for him, I'm not sure about that. But the Braves were interested for sure. Can you imagine Kamish either of them? But I mean, let's put Yachty in this conversation of Yachty or Molina playing in another uniform after all this. <laughs> I, uh, I guess it could have happened. I mean, he was a free agent, and he was entertaining it, just like he said he would. He, he would, you know, look at the market. But uh, it, it came back together. Was it ever close, do you think, uh, for either of them to go anywhere else? I think once <clears throat> they got word that Arenado could be had in a deal, they kind of put everything else on the table for a little bit and, and discussed amongst themselves that if, if the Cardinals sign got Arenado traded for him, which they did, that they would sign on right away, and they did sign on right away. And the thing about this is, this is not a was not a charity signing. These are still two of their best players. I'm looking to next year. Why would you not want them back next year now at, at age 40 and 39 respectively? Why not? I mean, Molina's going to be, I would think, I would hope on the All Star team this year, and Wainwright probably won't be, but he's going to be a, a double figures winner. And uh, when the, with the, everything is collapsing around him on the pitching staff, he's the one bastion still standing out there. Yeah, you know, at the start of the season, I would not have put the Cardinals in the top five teams in the National League, I don't think. But I would have had the Braves in there. And uh, I, I felt pretty good about the Braves. I know they've dealt with some injuries, and, and so have the Cardinals. But, Kamish, uh, I feel like these two teams, it's still early to gauge, but I feel like towards the deadline, for what you just referred to, Arenado, Molina, and Wainwright, they're not just going to sit on their hands, are they? I mean, they're, they're going to get – get busy here. Well, I think the Cardinals can't afford to wait that long because their pitchers don't come back. Their good ones don't come back till after the deadline, meaning Flaherty, Michaelis, and Hicks. Uh, that's three of their top, well, top six or seven guys anyway, but three of their, of their 13 or 14 on their staff. So they have to replenish from outside. Not a, You're not going to get any great stars right now because not enough teams are out of the race to be unloading people, and the Cardinals don't have a lot to trade. Um, they have to survive these injuries, and I'm sure Obi can, can talk about the Braves injuries. That they've had as many or more than the Cardinals, plus they got uh, Ozuna hurt and also likely to be suspended at some point here. Yeah, what do you think, David? I mean, how are, are the Cardinals and Braves going to be going after the same thing here, pitching help? Uh, the Braves need to have a, need to add a bat too. I mean, they've uh, you know once they lost Darno early on, he's supposed to be back in August, but you never can you know, tell what he's going to be like after tearing a thumb leg and missing two plus months. Uh, Marcelo Zuna is completely up in the air. They're not, I'm not counting on him to play again, not just this year for the Braves but ever. So you don't know, even though he signed a five-year deal or four-year deal, it's a, a very ugly situation. So that was their guy last year that led the, the national league in home runs and RBIs and he's gone. So uh, they need a bat as well as uh pitching help and and i mean they've at least got they're counting on getting soroka back in august or september they're counting on getting the waskari noah back in august and he was outstanding before he broke his hand he punching a, a stupid move punching a, the bench after a frustrating start in in, in uh, milwaukee so you know the rotation would be in a lot better shape with, with either or those guys and uh 
uh, it's come around a little bit. The bullpen looks a little bit better now with Shane Green back. They re-signed him, and he just debuted a week a week and a half ago. And with Charlie uh, or with uh, Chris Martin back, who missed about five or six weeks, he was hurt the first week of the season, first weekend of the season, and he came back about two weeks ago and has been outstanding since he got back. So there are reasons to believe that the bullpen's on the rise because it's been pretty bad all year after having such a good deep bullpen last year and letting Melanson go. And uh, that was a mistake. Letting O'Day go, letting Green go. They, like I said, they re-signed Green, who nobody who wanted more than anybody wanted to give him and sat out the first month of the season. So, you know, they need some help, but they need a bat as well as a, as well as a possibly an arm, but they're going to yeah. do something. They've got some money to spend. They, the payroll is way below what it was last year right now. Yeah, certainly. Uh, and, you know, Brendan, uh, Zalock said on our station earlier this week that, uh, you know, maybe we can shake things up a little bit. It's hard to, to know what he can actually do to do that, knowing that he does not want to trade any of his top prospects. So that uh, ties his hands a little bit. Yeah, and, you know, he's often talked about incremental improvements. And so I feel like that's the range of potential names that you could look for that he could be scouring for right now. You know, sometimes it's a reliever cast off by another team who maybe needs a change of scenery and could benefit you. I think that would be an area that the Cardinals could be focusing on right now. I understand that it's difficult to make those big trades at this point in the calendar, especially when you're going to be protective of your top prospects. Maybe as it gets a little closer to July 31 and you've got other teams kind of coming to terms with where they are in the standings and committing to sell some of their bigger names off. But I think right now the Cardinals, they've got their big three in the bullpen, Cabrera, Gallegos, and Reyes that have been really strong for them this season. Behind that trio, though, it's been a little questionable. And so while I wouldn't say the bullpen is the number one issue with this team, I think you could find that a move here or there to, to supplement the, the mid part of that bullpen could be beneficial to the Cardinals. And then kind of like David was talking about with the Braves, it's a matter of injuries. And if you can get these guys back healthy, Kamish mentioned some of the top names on the pitching staff. You want to get them back and then maybe a Harrison Bader returns at some point offensively. Like that's the team the Cardinals expected to have. And if they have that team, I think they can be pretty competitive. But it's a question of how long can you wait to supplement the roster that's currently being put on the field uh, before you can just say, yeah, we can sit and wait for these guys to return. It's kind of a tough proposition, a tough spot for the front office to be in. But that's kind of where they're sitting right now. Well, we hope you're enjoying Ball Talk from the St. Louis chapter of the Baseball Writers Association of America. And thank you to all of you who have subscribed already. Subscriptions are really great because all of the money goes to fund scholarships to take care of these young writers moving forward. And we thank you so much for them. The donation, $3 for a single episode. It's $12 for a half season and 20 bucks for the full subscription of 16 episodes of Ball Talk. Well, we appreciate all of our subscribers, and we do uh, throw out some fan questions. I wanted to get to that, where you, we invite you to submit questions. You can do, do that on social media, at Twitter, at St. Louis BBWAA. Uh, STL Ball Talk is the hashtag. We also have a Facebook page, St. Louis BBWAA. This is not just a St. Louis question, so David can jump in on this, too. Uh, but, you know, the media landscape has changed. I alluded to this in the beginning. Brendan, I'll, I'll kind of start with you on this, where – you know, Bob Burns uh, was one of the innovators. He crossed over on, on our station, KMOX Radio. He went from print to becoming one of the first radio hosts in town. Um, now it's pretty much commonplace, isn't it? I mean, you'd be an example of that where uh, you would uh, do a lot of different things other than just write. Yeah, I actually started at KFNS. Radio is my first kind of gig that I had in town. And I think being able to, especially if you're, you're talking about young people trying to make their way into the business, being able to be flexible and, and adept at doing multiple things, whether it's talking, whether it's writing, whether, you know, whatever it is, social media definitely plays a part in that as well. That's kind of the new school way of, of branding yourself and being able to brand yourself to employers in particular, uh, because the, the, the new world of new media, you got to be able to do a little bit of everything. And so at least from my experience, that's what I've tried to do and had some fun with it as well with social media and to be able to engage with with potential readers or listeners whatever it is that you're looking to get into uh, that can certainly be a, a, a benefit in, in today's landscape as, as it continues to shift and evolve 
David, there's a balance there, isn't there? Uh, of staying with what you do best, but also uh, making sure that you get out there as much as you can. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, I mean, for writers, obviously it all comes back to writing, whether that's using the writing for, you know, podcasts or whatever, if you can write, it certainly helps. It's hard to, it's hard to go into many different forums if you can't write, you know, I mean, you, you can do broadcasting, but if you can't write, you can't write. <laughs> so, but uh, for us writers, yeah, we've, we've had to, we've been forced to adapt basically whether you wanted to or not. And uh, it's not, it's not that hard unless you just don't like going in front of a camera or don't like speaking publicly at all, but you know, it's not asking that much to do a podcast here or, you know, uh, or uh you know, something like this there, you know, we do, I do a podcast twice a week and I have a former Braves reliever, Eric O'Flaherty He's my co-host and it's gone much better than we even anticipated. And, you know, there's times where I'm so glad that we have it because we discuss some things that, you know, Eric is so candid and open that I really couldn't fit some, a lot of that stuff into a story, a, a 20 inch story or a 30 inch story. We just have discussions and some things come out in conversations that, we it'd be hard to fit into a story, but uh, when it comes across as a casual conversation, a lot of readers and listeners really like hearing it. It's kind of supplemental to uh, some to other stuff that I do, and and a lot of times I pluck some things from the pro, from the podcast and do write a story off of it. Like we had Evan Gaddis on, and he admitted to cheating. He said the Astros cheated, and it was unfair for them, uh, for uh, for their opponents, for the game, for the fans. He said all that on our podcast. I used that for a story. So you can you can uh, kind of kind of cross cross uh use all all the stuff and uh, on occasion like that but there's no doubt that uh, that it's multimedia multi-platform job now whereas used to you didn't worry about what shirt you were wearing or whether you you know combed your hair before uh you went to work <laughs> yeah, i hear that uh commish one of the great game story writers ever uh, but i'll tell you you got a nice touch no with doubt. the fans the <laughs> no doubt man. he is unbelievable at telling a story you are um, was and is. Yeah, you, you have a, a nice touch when it comes to dealing with the fans, because as you know, as much as anybody, they're passionate. And but I, I do read your chats, and uh, I think you handle them quite well. What do you think about that interaction? Well, it's probably something that uh, is not high in my list of of, of things that I. I, I <laughs> know about enjoy doing I, I i know it's part of the business <laughs> and i i try to maintain some sense of decorum there are some of the the questions in the in the line of baseball isn't like football if you lose on sunday exactly. in football that loss stays you for a whole nother week or two weeks if you have a bye week in baseball you're playing again in 12 to 24 hours doesn't mean anything. <laughs> try, but you try, can't try working in sec countries <laughs> the, heart, the heart of SEC country. I shouldn't say you guys are SEC country now. I mean, this isn't the heart of the You're country the here. Of it. I'm in the heart of it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I, I have to remind people sometimes, Commission, it's, it's 162, not 12. This is that, I mean, I know they're rabid like college football fans, but yeah, there's there's still time. I'm like, I mean, both these you go kicking and screaming into some of these things, like, uh, like Q&As with fans and chats with fans. And you might not like doing them, but sometimes you end up doing it and you get they go really well, even if you didn't want to do it. Fans really appreciate it, like it. We might get more subscribers because we do it. Who knows? Well, I, I agree with you. And, and and sometimes you learn some things if you keep your ears open. You don't you know you don't know everything. I don't know everything. I mean, uh, Brendan know everything. He's got a long way to go. He'll know he'll know it all someday, but he doesn't know it all now. <laughs> and uh, um, so yeah, you can learn a lot, and you just got to to uh, keep your wits about you and remind yourself first, and and them secondarily that uh, they, we got 90 some games to go here. Yeah. You can still see the Braves and the Cardinals in the playoffs. They're both around 500. The Cardinals are at it and the Braves are two or three below. And uh, it should be an entertaining series coming up when they play, you know, and I, I try to tell big fans that here that are uh, like, is it too late for the Braves or they've already written them off and time to rebuild. And I'm like, they're five games back with 99 to go. How fast it wasn't that long ago when the Braves blew a double digit lead in September. You know, and you're saying it can't make up five games in '99. <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah, we remember that in St. Louis. <laughs> That's the right. Mets are the That's Mets have got started. one, yeah, one pitcher. What, the Mets have got a pitcher who might blow out anytime he's out there. And Degrom, he he's yep. clearly the best in baseball. But every game something happens to him: yep. hamstring, flexor tendon. He's going to blow out. 
That's right. You know, the, the fans are, uh, while they might not have access to the clubhouse like we do, I mean, they have access to a lot of content. I mean, there's, you can get a lot of stuff. And so sometimes they'll send you a note like, Hey, O'Brien wrote about, you know, the Braves uh, pitching situation or, you know, something that maybe I wasn't able to catch and that they, they are always on top of what's going on out there. So that's good. And they hear I mean, things too. I mean, they hear they, things that you don't even hear sometimes on the street. No doubt. A friend of a friend knows this guy's wife, that kind of thing. You hear a lot of things on social media that we didn't used to hear. There is no question about that. Uh, Kamish, I, I think one thing that we can all agree on, I think, is that there are a lot of video replays and I think they might be a little too long. Uh, what do you think about the current situation with review in the game and how can this be remedied? Well, I've been thinking about this a little bit and I do think the fans are entertained by the length of time between the play and then the, the actual judgment of the play, because the scoreboard gets to show some of that stuff. Now before they couldn't show it at all. Then it was boring to have, <laughs> but now you can see it on the big screen. If you have a, a portable device, you can see it on the small screen. And I, I think it involves them more. Uh, they sure they want to see the home team get the benefit of the doubt. But um, I do think more plays are reviewed than need be. Now, those two at home plate last night, they needed to be reviewed because as both runners missed the plate, Schilt contends Carlson didn't miss the plate when he came in the first time. Well, why do you try to go back then? <laughs> he just, he thought he had it. And, uh, and, and Wainwright, you know, Bless his heart, was in a perfect position to back up the play and, and, the, and the first one and yelled at Molina, hey, this guy missed the plate. Adam Duvall, one of your, one of your favorites, maybe. And um, so I think they're okay as long as they're not used more than well, – I, I can go without being used at all some nights, but the, the ones last night I thought were legitimate replays, and I didn't, I didn't mind the length of time, even though it took five minutes of time – on the clock when you're writing a game story for an edition, that doesn't help you any, but it, does, it, it was good for the, the fans and they got up and got them both right, I think. And it was all right. Yeah. I hear that. I think if you're at the game, certainly, you know, it's a chance to maybe, Hey, you know, get another beer or, you know, take a bite of that hot dog. And you're not missing any action, but um, I guess Brendan, the, the hard part sometimes is those non reveals I mean, when you have that ball that rolled down the line, for example, and you have Yachty and Arenado, uh, standing there over it and it rolls foul. Uh, but the, it's called, it's called fair and it's not reviewable. That doesn't seem right. Yeah. I think where they draw the line on plays that you can do with replay review is kind of tricky. I think part of that though, is the the lack of like infinite camera angles. I know they've got a lot of them and they do a great job with being able to, to get eyes on as many plays as possible. But I think what we're seeing now is, even when a play obviously needs to be reviewed and it's bang, bang, and it's really close and you're going to spend two to three minutes on it. If, if you aren't pretty confident at the end that you did get it right, whereas last night, I don't think that was the issue, but a lot of times it does seem like you can kind of predict like, okay, I think here's what actually happened, but here's what I think they're going to say. They're going to stay with the call on the field. And that's most of the time what you, you see end up happening almost regardless of whether it was right or wrong. It, you know, you could say we're pretty sure that this is what it looked like, but because we don't have indisputable video evidence, they don't overturn it. And so while I think there are plays, in my opinion, if you're going to do the replay review, find a way to have every play be reviewable. There are plays that I think if you did add them to the list, you would say, well, we don't have the perfect angle of this. And so because of that, we've got to stick with the call on the field. That's where I think they, they do a little bit too much of the replay review. If you can't get a perfect angle, it's kind of become predictable which plays are going to be overturned and which ones aren't. And that's where I think it takes a little bit out of the fun of it. David, I'll let you get the last word on this. So do you have anything to add on video replay? I, I'm a, uh, I've been a critic of video replay since its inception because I don't think – I think while it could be used properly, and some of the things you've pointed out are reviewable calls – uh, plays at the plate, that kind of thing, fair or foul. There's other times where plays aren't reviewable that should be. But my real problem with it is the way that it's – the as it's currently set up, they send it to New York to be for the play to be reviewed. There should be a way for that umpire and crew to New York to not know what the original call was because I think they are totally – against overruling their brethren unless it is so overwhelming the evidence and it's rare that what the evidence is going to be overwhelming 
that shouldn't have to be. This isn't a court of law. You know, it it, it, it should be if every fan knows at home is 99 percent certain that that play should be reversed. Yet that crew in New York ne- doesn't do it. It's like, OK, there's something wrong with that. I mean, you know, it's a, it, it they should they're so reluctant to overturn because it's umpires and they're overturning their own um, other umpires. And I think if the, the crew in New York did not know what the initial call was, whether that means they don't watch the game live while it's on the monitors, they just, you know, they, that, you know, I don't know how they would do it, but that would be to me, the best way to do it is send the, send the call to them. They don't know if it was safe or out. They don't know, you know, just tell them what is the ruling. And that would be a fair ruling rather than them being, pers- them being swayed by knowing that the call was safe. Is there enough evidence to overturn it? I think that's what the whole problem was. And I also hate the fact that, there are calls made at second base, third base when the guy slides uh, and his momentum, his natural momentum carries him off the back for a split second. Now every infielder leaves the glove on top of the fielder. That's not the spirit of the rule. That's not the way baseball was played for 150 years. And what does that accomplish? All it does is guys are more reluctant to steal than ever because they're scared that their momentum is going to take them past the bag and they're going to come off. You can't even see it with the naked eye how quickly – the, how little they come off and, and what does that prove if a guy just leaves the glove on top of them and then the replay shows he came off for i mean a split second that that that's not what it was intended to do uh, so that i hate that part of the rule right there uh, so I, I just uh I, on balance i don't think replay has made the game better i think it's made it worse the way it's used yeah that's a great point it's one of the greatest times in the game is when everything reaches second base the the ball from yeah. the catcher the infielder the runner i got that from lou brock he always and told inertia. me that was just- yeah lou brock would be able to do what he did because the inertia takes the body sometimes you can't stay in contact with the base simply because you're going so fast and they shouldn't yep. be penalized for coming off the bag for a split second and have and if you want more action in the game that doesn't help it right yeah. if we want more action in, in plays and interesting plays for fans to watch not having those, like disincentivizing those, that's not helpful to, to bettering the game overall. Yeah. And a big defender like like a Baez or somebody can just push the guy off the bat. Yeah. You know? yeah. We've seen it. There's no question. Uh, gentlemen, I really appreciate it. Before we go, I want to introduce uh, this segment, and that is our best of from the Baseball Writers Dinner here in St. Louis. All clips, by the way, from the past eight years are on our YouTube channel. Just search St. Louis Baseball Writers Association. Uh, Mark DeJohn, you were talking about baseball lifers. There's one right there. Uh, over 30 years uh, involved with the Cardinals, 40 years in baseball overall. Uh, he was part of the, the George Kissel trade, you know, to teach the game to the Cardinals organization. Played a significant role in the rise and development of Mike Schilt, actually. And he talked about that when he was uh, given the Good Guy Award at last year's Baseball Writers Dinner. Let's watch this clip. For me, this gentleman is a one-day Red Jacket Award winner um, for what he's contributed to our St. Louis Cardinal organization. So it starts with the care of the Cardinals. Beyond that, he cares for our players. And he's touched our players, and he's touched them in a lot of different ways. And and emotionally, um, of course, he's touched them in the way that they've learned how to play the game and and understand how to play the game the right way, the Cardinal way. Um, And then I can speak to very, very closely. um, He's been sincere about growing and helping us as staff members, me included. I'm not standing here today as the manager of St. Louis Cardinals, not even coming close without not only the advocacy of DJ, but the love he's given me, the tough love he's given me, and the care he's given me, and his um, willingness to care more about my career than his own. Um, This is a man that has exponential, unbelievable baseball knowledge, but he has more of a concern with sharing it to people in a heart for it and the thing that i've always loved about him and i do love him and um you know we're going to miss him quite a bit i already do but um you know this is a this is a gentleman that um you can count on and that says a lot you know, this organization's counted on him the players that have been blessed to be a part of his life have, have counted on him and the staff has been able to count on him and and he's grown us exponentially and um, ultimately, the thing you appreciate about him is he's going to tell you the truth. And he's going to tell you because you need to hear it. And he's going to tell you because he cares about you. And um, I don't know how this guy didn't win this award earlier, but you're talking about one of the best guys I've ever known in my life and my best friend and mentor and someone I love dearly, Mark Dijon. 
DJ, how about that? Well, Go ahead and have a seat. Okay. Well, <laughs> don't hurt. Don't get hurt. Well, first thing I, w I really want to tell the people is I won this award legitimately. <laughs> <laughs> There's no recount, no investigation. <laughs> it's the real I deal. I won it. <laughs> and I, I, you know, let's, let's be honest, I deserve it. Okay. <laughs> so, the other thing I, so oh, hold on a second, Rick. All right. <laughs> The other thing I want to tell you is... You, have you ever met Lurio DeRocher, by the way? Uh, no, no, okay, no, go no, ahead. no. The other thing I just want to tell you is, you know, the Cardinals, the Cardinals draw 40,000 mm -hmm. a night. I drew 600, not bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> pretty good. So thank you for coming out to see me. And, uh, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed this. Go ahead, Rick. I have no doubt, DJ, that everybody is here to see you. But I, I got to ask you first, uh, what's your reaction to those uh, wonderful things uh, said to you about your dear friend, Mike Schilt. Well, Mike is, um, he's, he's very special to me. And Mike is, I, I look at Mike and I'm so proud of him because I feel like Mike represents part of what I've given, given back to, to all the things that, that uh, were given to me. And what people, what people don't know is that a lot of, most of what I gave to Mike, and uh, I gave him an opportunity, he coached for me, and I let him do a lot of things, and he took off with it. But uh, he is a, I, I gave him the information that, that George Kissel gave to me. But what people really don't know is a lot of what I gave to, to Mike Schilt came from one of the great baseball minds of the game, and that's, that's uh, the next uh, Cardinal Hall of Famer, Ted Simmons. Ted, what Ted did for me and what Ted taught me, and Ted taught it in a tough way because he was just, he was, just a, he was a tough guy, but, and, but what he taught me is a lot of things that, that I've passed on to Mike. And the only thing I told Mike, I said, you're getting it from me, but if you really want to get it from the true professor, you need to, you need to talk to Ted. So what Mike Schilt, the way he handled his bullpen is, comes a lot from, from what Ted Simmons taught to me and I passed on to Mike. One of the best, Mark DeJohn and uh, the Baseball Writers Dinner. Can't wait to get back to that big crowd uh, here in downtown St. Louis. Well, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. David, we love having our out-of-town writers jumping in. Thank you and best to you in Atlanta, and uh, Thanks, we'll keep in buddy. touch. All right. Brendan, all the best over at KMOV, my man. It's great to hear from you here on Ball Talk. Yes, sir. This was a blast. Thank you, guys. And Kamish, we go way back. We've had a lot of great conversations through the years. I miss those uh, in person but now that we've opened back up, I think we need to uh, start doing that again. We'll, we'll catch up real soon. I fully can cry. I want to ask David of that picture of that bike behind him is the, one of the ones he rides to the ballpark every night when he's covering the team. <laughs> I'll be riding tonight. No, no chance of rain. <laughs> nice. Very nice. So we'll catch up with you all soon. Thanks to Steve Pona and our outstanding crew. This has been Ball Talk. We appreciate your subscriptions and we appreciate your support of the St. Louis chapter of the BBWAA.